Welcome everybody to this webinar on the analysis of beam sensitive materials using direct detection of I electrons. So just a, a quick outline of what I would like to talk about today. Um, first of all, how to obtain this capability. So how can we look at beam sensitive materials? And uh, one of the first things you will need for that is an improved detector sensitivity. So I'll briefly introduce the direct detection um, system that we have um, that allows us measuring with very low currents, low voltages. But after that, I also want to go a little bit deeper because it's not just reducing current, reducing KV, and we are always good. Question is, can we go as low as we like? So what, what is the limit? Where, um, what do we have a, a certain exposure time a certain beam current that we need before we can see anything on EBSD. And then the second half of my talk are a number of analysis examples um, that I've been doing over the last two years uh, together with a number of uh, customers, a number of other labs on, on different uh, beam sensitive materials. So let's start with a quick introduction into direct detection. And the detector that we use for that is the Clarity. And this was designed um, in the last years just to allow us to get to the next level of EBSD pattern collection. And one of the first requirements was to remove the optical path. So no phosphor screen, no lens system. So any distortion, anything that we would introduce during the transmission of the signal was taken out. So there's no distortion and everything we see on the detector really is coming from the sample. Now, direct electron is, is not uh, something new. It's been known in the electron microscopy community for a number of years. And I think for about 10 years now, it's widely in use in a TEM mainly biological analysis, also very beam sensitive materials where people can work with low dose conditions to see those fragile materials. Um, a few years ago, it has also been demonstrated to work for EBSD applications, but that never really uh, took on. And that had a few reasons. One reason was that the sensor, it's just a chip, was sitting on a printed circuit board. And the geometry of that board made it very difficult to position it close to the, EB, to the EBSD sample at the proper tilt angle. So we couldn't get a good solid angle to get enough bands. And maybe even a more important problem was the temperature. It's a CMOS sensor and these sensors get warm. And when you put them on a printed circuit board in the vacuum, then you can work for about 15, 20 minutes and then everything will just get too warm and it cuts out. Now, for the clarity, we have developed a system in the traditional geometry. So it's a side mounted EBSD detector with a tube that you can insert to close to your sample. There are multiple chips. Uh, it's a two by two array with a single continuous top sensor. And so effectively it's 512 by 512 pixels. And from the tube going out, there is a passive cooling system. So we can just let it run for very, very long times. I just collected a scan here for more than 24 hours, and that is no problem. Everything is nice and stable. Now, how does it work? Um, here we see the detector on the right hand side, and it's the, the chip itself. Um, is, is positioned very close to the sample. Sample is in a normal 70 degree EBSD position. And here on the left, you can see a little cross section schematic of the sensor. And this is the, the top um, silicon sensor. So the electrons hit the sensor, there's a bias voltage, you get uh, electron hole pairs, just like in an EDS detector actually, and the signal goes into an amplifier. Then comparator, so we just see what is real, what's not real, so we're going to remove all the noise that we have in the system. And this read noise actually is below 3 kV. 
So there's virtually no noise at all in the system once we, we've gone through this step. And after that, we can count an event. So effectively, we can count single electrons coming in. So we can quantify the signal that is coming in. And the, the detector itself has a very large bit depth. So as I say here, 13.5, it's about 11 and a half thousand intensity levels. And if you just collect enough electrons to fill the wells in the sensor, you get very, very uh, vibrant uh, EBSD patterns with lots of detail because we can distinguish um, all the different gray levels, different intensity levels. And when you do that, you can work very nicely with um, the intensity gradients that we have in EBSD patterns, you get very good pattern quality. And you can use that for crystallographic analysis, combinations with um, dynamic simulations, image correlation applications, etc. They're very nice, sharp images. The second type of application, and that's what I want to focus on a little bit more in this presentation, is that we don't need to capture this many intensity levels, of course. When we just have a few gray levels, it may already be enough to identify the bands in our diffraction pattern. And that allows for low dose pattern collection of these sensitive materials. So just a, a little example. This is a pattern collected with 5,000 electrons on average in each pixel. And you can see that the contrast in the middle is much higher than at the edges. And that is just the number of electrons hitting a certain part of the sensor. And if you look at the chart at the bottom, there's a lot of detail there. And that is really crystallographic detail that is coming from the diffraction. If we don't want to wait that long, we can collect a pattern with 10 electrons on average per pixel. And when you then look at the chart at the bottom, it's, it's very noisy. And this is just, yeah, just a few electrons in, in general coming in, but the bands are still recognizable. And that is actually enough to index the patterns and get um, good orientation determinations. Uh, just to, to show you the effect of the uh, number of events and how long we have to measure, this is a sequence of patterns at 10 kV with about 380 picoamp of current. And when we then expose for 20 milliseconds, we get a maximum dose per pixel at 50. And on average, that is going to be between 10 and 15 electrons anywhere on the sensor. So if we just increase the exposure. You can see the number of electrons increasing. And also the, the contrast in the pattern is coming up. So we start to see more and more detail. At 20 kV, uh, we get a larger signal in the material, but also in the detector. It's more sensitive. Um, it just gives a, a higher um, electron hole pair uh, result for each impact. And you can see we get more electrons coming in. We can also measure a little bit shorter. And also here you can see the contrast increasing. So if we just go up, you just see the details are already, already here at a few hundred electrons. But if we keep going, we get more and more detail. And here at two and a half thousand to 6,000 um, electrons per pixel, you have really nice diffraction patterns with lots of detail, very sharp edges. OK, so we can quantify this. We can see how many bands or how many electrons uh, we're going to get. Now the question is, how much do we really need? And this is a, a simulated diffraction pattern from silicon, where on average there's only one electron per pixel. So a lot of the pixels in this image are just black. There is no signal at all. And the maximum is down here at the bottom where we get 10 electrons per pixel. And this, this, this pattern looks quite nice. And this is with a few tens of picoamps in the model. So that should be possible to um, get indexable patterns there. 
But if we look at an experimental pattern, this is austenite. And here we have an average of 40 electrons per pixel. And the pattern looks a little bit worse than on the silicon one. And remember, the silicon pattern of the simulation doesn't show any background. That means that a very large fraction of the electrons that hit the sensor don't carry the information that we want. So in this case, we have on average about 40 electrons per pixel and the maximum is only 50. So this one to 10 that we see in the simulation, we get in the experimental pattern as well. And that means that about 80% of the electrons that hit the sensor are um, showing the bands. So this only oh, sorry, 20% is showing the bands, 80% is just background noise. And when we do a background correction and we look at the, the pattern intensity, you can see a lot of noise and we can just make out the bands in this three-dimensional plot that I've made of this particular pattern. But it's enough. So when you have good diffraction patterns, um, this is very indexable. And we can go a little bit lower when we have really nice patterns. This is on uh, 3D printed steel, 13 picoamp of beam current. Material gives good patterns normally to begin with, so we don't need much. And then we can do EBSD mapping with about 10 electrons per pixel on average. So that's that's close to the lower limit of what is possible. Now, what is this minimum dose? Because I just showed some examples on nice diffracting materials like steel, iron, that gives very strong patterns anyway. But the signal levels that we get also depends very much on the backscatter coefficient. So the atomic number, it depends on the electron dose. It depends on the sample very much. How crystalline is it? How clean is the sample surface? And also a little bit on the detector efficiency. So what, what is this signal fraction over background? Can we quantify that a little bit better? And here we see a silicon pattern background corrected as we normally do when we work with EBSD and that really obscures the signal ratio. When you plot this in a three-dimensional plot, um, you can see the intensity gradient of course is gone and we have a lot of spikes everywhere and those that's all the details that we see in these bands that we can just make out. We can still see all the, um, the bands very nicely, we can index this but we can't really judge the background to diffraction ratio. So if we go to the unprocessed pattern, then if we stretch the, the image a little bit more, this is what it looks like. So we get an intensity gradient with the highest intensity more or less in the middle, and the bands are just superimposed on this gradient. And it's, it's, it's difficult to really quantify. It's also difficult to actually measure it. But when you estimate the height of some of these bands, of course, it's also even orientation specific. The actual band intensity is about 5 to 20% of the total signal. And here are similar plots for a sequence of materials going from very light materials, beryllium, and here the bands are almost painted on the intensity gradient. There's almost no contrast in there. Um, so that's that's probably less than 5% of the electrons that are actually giving us the bands. And if we go to heavier materials, silicon, iron, you start to see the bands really standing proud of this intensity gradient. And then it's very easy to find those bands. And then we are, but still only around 15 to 20% of the total signal. So 80 to 95% of whatever we get is not what we want. And of course, that also happens when we are going to look at beam sensitive materials. We are still going to have to throw away 90% of the signal because it doesn't contain the information that we need. You can also see that when we just do um, a simulation on the um, diffracted signal, so this is not taking into account the background intensity. And then from beryllium, you can see that the contrast really increases when you go to heavier materials.
So this is this is really what happens. And we can quantify that um, in the calculated backscatter yield. And when you look here on the left, platinum, iron, silicon, beryllium, when you go to high KV, beryllium has the lowest yield, and then platinum, iron, etc., um, are a little bit higher. When you drop the KV, the efficiency changes. Um, and platinum is still nicely increasing um, the yield, but beryllium is dropping. So the lower the KV, the lower the signal. And again, that is a backscatter coefficient um, property. So that also goes for other types of materials that are very light. When we then invert this chart into the required exposure time, so these are just relative exposure times, of course, the lighter the material, the longer you have to wait. And at lower KVs, that effect is getting worse. And when we just translate that in how much we need at 20 KV uh, beam energy, 100 picoamp of beam current, where we get about 50 electrons per pixel, then you can see that for platinum, we may need about 20 milliseconds to reach that intensity. And for beryllium, you have 90 to 95 milliseconds. So four to five times more time required for light materials. Now, if we look at the, the patterns, when we just fill the entire um, well depth of the sensor, um, we can get good patterns everywhere. So it's beryllium, silicon. Uh, you can just see the bandwidth changing very wide at 10 kV to much, much narrower at 30. But the contrast doesn't change too much. So this is after the normal background correction and image stretching that we always do. But the difference again is in the exposure time that you read that you need. It, it goes for here for gold, 177 milliseconds for this particular condition to two and a half times more or less for beryllium. And at low KV, it's from 500 to 1350. So again, that's uh, almost three times um, the intensity that you need. So what we saw in the, the simulation, we can more or less reproduce here um, in experimental patterns. <clears throat> and if we then try to collect data on um, these, these samples, this is the data from the plot on the previous uh, slide. You can see the exposure time required with accelerating voltage. This is at 915 picoamp, and we just keep counting until we have about 90% sensor illumination. So, um, yeah, more than 10,000 electrons uh, per pixel on average. Um, what you'll see here that from 30 to 20 kV, there's not much difference. To 15, it starts to rise a little bit, and 10, it really goes up. And what happens there is a combination of the backscatter coefficient. We saw that before, but it's also, and its main effect is here, the sample surface. The lower the KV, the more sensitive your signal is going to get to any contamination or any um, surface defects from the preparation or oxidation, perhaps. And on top, there's also a certain detector efficiency because with lower KV, you're getting fewer electron hole pairs in the sensor, so you have a little bit less detection. <clears throat> Just to, to compare that with the simulation, um, it, is, it is similar. Brilliant goes up, as we can see here, but the other ones also go up a little bit. And again, that's the sample and detector efficiency. Um, when I um, calculate that back, not from atomic number, but just on density, then also we see the same effect and it really shows up or throw, goes up at the lower uh, density materials. Now, what, let's take a look at what the patterns actually look like. Silicon, platinum. Um, this is, the, again, the same conditions that we made all these uh, simulations for. On the left, one millisecond exposure. 
for silicon on average we have six electrons for platinum we have eight and you can just make out the pattern on the silicon platinum is a bit easier so that's the the background to to band ratio that really makes this so much nicer and if we go to longer exposure times you can see the contrast um, improvement when we do a background correction at 50 milliseconds the patterns appear very similar at one millisecond you can again just make out the bands and if we do some averaging 15 times we can actually index with these doses quite nicely so this this averaging is something we have to remember i'll, I'll come back to that later okay now let's take a look at um what that brings us let's look at some sensitive materials the first one i want to display here is some uh, a biomineral sample a shell a brachiopod shell it's a it's a marine um a marine animal and when you section that um, it's a calcite uh, matrix with a lot of organic material in between which means that you cannot just measure longer or go to a higher currents because it will just yeah fry the organic material which effectively coats the calcite close to the point of impact and you lose everything so when we collect a map here and here on the left you can the top left there we have an area that indexes almost nothing in the iq map there's no contrast those black circles are organic conduits so there's organic material going through the structure and here on the lower right that's the outer edge of the shell there we have um, better crystallinity and we have better patterns we can see that here on the right we also have nice indexing but still a lot of noise pixels in between where the pattern quality was just not good enough to index now this is what brings me back to this averaging we saw that when you go from very low current and you average 15 times the pattern quality dramatically improves and that is something that we can do with the tool we call NPAR NPAR neighbor pattern averaging and re-indexing what that does is it's like a moving average we go for a single point we get a pattern and then we take the six pixels around it on the hexagonal scanning grid that we normally use and we average those so we are working with a pattern that is seven times averaged and then we can index it and that brings us from this original pattern to this optimized pattern with improved signal to noise ratio the end part thing is is nice because it's something we do offline it costs a little bit in lateral resolution and in most cases that doesn't hurt too much but it does not add to the electron dose that we have to apply to the sample now this example is from the good area so this is one of the better patterns and if we do the same trick on the top left then this is what we get you can yeah with a bit of imagination you can see where the zone axes are on on this pattern here on the left but after npar we can actually identify some of the bands and in this material that is enough for indexing and then we go from this indexing result to this so the contrast in the iq map really improves that means that the, the patterns inside the grains are better so the bands are stronger in the band detection which is what gives me this brightness um, in the grains and grain boundaries we still have poor patterns so the, the difference between the edges and the grain interiors is increasing and here we can now see on the top left we can actually see the microstructure with these circular flat grains around those uh, organic uh, areas and here on the right hand side you have the color coding as well so it, it's not perfectly indexed but it is enough to really get a good indication of the microstructure okay then i have a number of examples on perovskites so first the between brackets easy ones halide perovskites so there's no organic material in there and the information I want to show is, is provided by 
uh, Gede Adjaxa from Emolf in Amsterdam, and also um, a sample that I received from Dr. Julian Steele from the KU Leuven in Belgium. I uh, have a number of references if you want to read up on what they've done uh, with these materials. And these are some example patterns. This is a <clears throat> on the left, that is the original pattern during mapping, and you can see it's already a lot better than what we just had on the brachiopod. When we do re-indexing, and we don't even need NPAR for that, so we just stretch the signal for each individual pattern, we can easily um, index it and get an orientation. And here we have the first mapping for this. Um, this is at about 10 kV uh, to 300 picoamp and 100 millisecond exposure. So that's what we needed to get good data. And then on this film material, we could get here in the, this red map, that's the IPF map. So it's a fiber texture, as you can see here on the right. Almost all the grains have the C axis aligned and the other axis um, distributed around the edge of the pole figure. And here on the right is a grain size map where the larger grains are red, the smaller ones are blue, and that's also indicated here in this uh, in this grain size chart. So once we have the, the indexing, of course, we can do all the normal EBSD um, quantifications and, and analysis. Now, another one, this was a little bit more tricky. Um, this is an ITO substrate with fibers of um, an inorganic lead halide perovskite on top, and then it was sintered. And during the sintering, these, these fibers are merged, they're fusing, and they are producing these flower-like structures. You can see a radial microstructure with the center with all the points going outwards. It, it even looks a little bit like dendrites. And the question on this material was, are these recrystallizing completely? And are these now single grains? Or do we still get um, a remnant of the original fiber structure? And do we have a whole range of um, orientations inside each of these clusters? Now also here, around 10 kV, 200 picoamp, 15 millisecond exposure. And first thing I had to do was try to find some patterns just to see if I could index this. Now, pattern quality is pretty good. Um, so here we can get nice indexing. I could use this to optimize my reflector table because if you're familiar with EBSD, um, we need to apply a structure file or a reflector table for indexing. But where do you get that? Um, we can simulate it, we can calculate it, um, but the models are not perfect. Or we can get it, for example, from X-ray data and all the large crystallographic structure databases, like the, the powder diffraction file from ICDD or the ICSD database, they're all based on X-ray diffraction. And X-ray diffraction and electron diffraction may give totally different intensities for specific uh, lattice planes. So what you would need to do once you have a structure file like this from a CIF um, file, for example, you need to check if all the bands that are shown in the overlay are really present in the original material, in the underlying pattern. And all the bands that may have had a strong diffraction signal in, um, in XRD and are not visible here, we have to remove those. So we only use the bands that the software can pick up automatically. And then I collect the map, I store all the patterns so I can do NPAR and everything I want to do later. And in most cases, I just move my mouse over the map offline and just to see if I can grab a number of patterns. And in this case, it's, it's very distinctive. There's one band that is very, very strong and the rest is, is a lot weaker. So we have like a nice anchor for this um, indexing. It's this, this green band here that we can just make out that helps me to identify if the indexing was correct. If I, I get 
the, the consistently the same lattice plane indexing that particular band. But then I could optimize the uh, reflector list and get good indexing everywhere. And that gave me this mapping result. So as you can see on the left is the IQ map. And all those clusters of points index reasonably well. It's a topographic sample, so a lot of areas are just shadowed. So we don't get 100% indexing, but we get a lot of information from those different clusters. Even this one is, looks a little bit skewed, so it's not straight up, but it's pointing sideways a little bit. Even there, we can get some information. It's light greenish color. Um, but from here, you can see that all those clusters are completely recrystallized, and there's no trace of the original fiber that was deposited on the substrate anymore. So that was that was a really nice result. And even nicer, when we look at the orientation distribution, when we take inverse pole figures, there's not that many grains, of course, but you can see it's not random. There's a very clear girdle here in the uh, 001 inverse pole figure. The other ones are a little bit less clear, but it's away from the 010 direction. And when you color code that, you can just correlate very easily all the points in the pole figures with the map. And here in the normal pole figures, the uh, structure is more pronounced. It's it's a very clear 010 centering where the other directions are around uh, the edge of the pole figure. So it's 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 almost a fiber. Not not completely. The 001 looks a little bit different, but you can see what is happening, where each cluster has a single orientation. <coughs> now, here's another one. Um, this is the fiber sample before sintering. Um, if you want to see a little bit more, you have the, the reference where that this uh, material came from, where it's described down here. Um, and mapping is just not possible on a material like this. So what you can do is Go in spot mode in the EBSD software and try to hit the very tips of these fibers. That, if you're lucky, and on most fibers actually that could work, you will get a surface that is projecting towards the EBSD detector. And in this case, I could get those uh, diffraction patterns. I just try to follow the outside of this whole cluster of this bundle of fibers. I could get indexing results everywhere. And with that, I get the orientations. And also here I have like um, a fiber texture where you can um, get, oh, well, fiber text may not be right, but you, you can follow the, the bundle in the orientations here of the C axis. The A axis are all around the circumference again, just like we saw before. And here also the B axis is pointing outwards. So you can, even on, on a sample like this, where mapping is not possible, there's still a lot of very valuable information to be had. Now let's go to a, a little bit more challenging material. Um, Methyl ammonium uh, perovskite. So there's more organic material in here, which makes them more sensitive. Um, these samples, Again, from uh, Amo, from Loretta, and Zhenyi Ni at the University of North Carolina uh, in the US. Uh, the last one is not published. The first one is published in this paper. And here we have um, an infrared annealed sample. So here we have, again, these like flower-like structures. We get patterns. We can index those, and we get beautiful um, EBSD map. So now we can get full area. This is not very topographic. So we get very dis consistent indexing. Two orientations effectively here that are sticking out. There's this purplish, pinkish color, which is here is the 112 orientation. And we have these green bands, which is the 100 pointing at us. But if we look in plane, um, the one we just had was the IPFZ, so it's sticking out of the sample. When you look in plane, we have a symmetric 
um, orientation distribution. So top, bottom and left, right are clearly different. They are mirrored almost. And here in the poll figure, you can see how the whole thing um, is oriented. Now here we have another one. This one was not um, annealed in the same way. So this is what the patterns look like. Not very challenge, not very interesting here. But when we stretch it, we, we have a lot of, of gray levels, by the way. So you can just make out the bands, and then we can really apply additional processing to um, to stretch the signal to get something indexable. And here we have um, a small scan on that material. Um, in the original indexing results, this is the IQ map. And here, the brighter it is, the better the pattern. Well, it's, it's almost all dark gray and black. There's no pattern at all. And we can get a little bit of indexing in a few of these small grains close to the top. There's In the rest, there's just nothing there. But when we apply NPAR to that, then life gets a lot more interesting. So these are from the good patterns. Then we can, with NPAR, it definitely gets a lot better. But even the poor ones improve so much that we can get this IQ map. And here we have <clears throat> very clear grain structure. You can see the, the flowers almost again. So this, these radial textures that we also have here, but here they are different orientations. So that's the original one. This is what NPAR can make of it. And when we index that, this is what we get. Um, in most grains, we get a few pixels indexing. It's not 100%. But it's good enough to get a nice texture calculation and also a good indication of the microstructure. Now, then this is um, a project I worked on not so long ago. Um, this was again glassy matrix or substrate with um, a MAPI perovskite film on top. We have those larger gray crystals. These were the ones of interest. And when we tilt, you see all these little white grains. When we tilt the sample, they're a little bit clearer. Those are small, probably lead iodide. We're not 100% sure what that is, because if I hit it with the beam, everything disintegrates. So I can't really identify where it comes from. Um, these images, I needed 8 kV, 50 picoamp, and low vacuum to, to keep this um, more or less stable. And this is what the um, initial indexing looked like. Again, everything is very dark, meaning very poor patterns, but we can make out those small grains at the top. And that was indexable. So, and also even some of the edges of those larger grains were producing uh, diffraction patterns. Now, if I go back here, you can see that those small grains are not randomly superimposed on the substrate, they appear to be in some kind of epitaxial relationship. So even if you cannot get indexing results from those larger grains, we can actually get information from the little crystal sticking out and infer what is underneath. Now, we can also apply NPAR on that in OIM analysis, and I just want to show you what that looks like. So here I have OAM analysis. This is the data set. And when I look at my pattern, oops. Oh, come on. Wake up. So if I move here, we can, now you can see a good pattern. Uh, this is a pattern from one of those very small bright particles that we can just make out there in the right. But when I go on the major grains, there's there's almost nothing there. Oh, here we can see something. If I move my mouse, I don't know if the connection is fast enough, we can just make out a pattern. And if I then apply NPAR and an additional 
dynamic processing, I can do a new background correction, so I can really stretch it. And then you can see that this pattern becomes that. And this is something that we can work with. This is indexable. So when I just use that and tell the system, okay, re-index this, And now you can see that even as we have significant topography, then in most of those larger matrix grains, we are actually getting usable, consistent indexing. So what you need to do on a sample like this is you collect your data at the low dose conditions. Sometimes you just have to accept that the patterns are extremely weak and then Afterwards, in many cases, you can actually um, do this, this NPAR process. You can optimize the contrast and image quality of the diffraction pattern and index it afterwards. So just let me stop that. Um, when I then look here, I had it already reprocessed. Then that is the result. So compared to that, that was the original indexing. So this is what, what NPAR can do um, on, on extremely weak samples like this. So if I just click here, um, this is after reprocessing. This is a Prius image. That's a picture that's also constructed from the EBSD patterns. Here we are using for every pattern, every pixel, we are looking at a band of, of points at the bottom of the diffraction pattern, look at the intensity there and, and build a picture on that. And Prius bottom is extremely sensitive to topography. So that gives you a beautiful topographic sample where we can recognize the small grains sticking out. You have the shape of all those grains. And in most cases we get usable EBSD data, just over 40% indexing, but enough information. Now, based on that, we remove all the, the bad points as I've done here, and there's the um, the texture. So it's with a bit of imagination, you can say, okay, there seems to be a little bit of a peak here in 111, but it's extremely weak. It's almost random. Now, then I tried the same trick on a larger area. <coughs> Initially, 8% indexed. Um, I was very careful. This took 17 hours to collect. This scan was, was slow. Um, and here again, initially, we just have the indexing of those small particles. But after NPAR, we can get that. So you have a really nice large area um, analysis of an overnight run. And here we have some sort of scratch. Now, if you look at the Prius image, it's it's hard to recognize that scratch. You don't see it. So something has hit it at some point, and it's it's very sensitive to that. Um, okay, I'll get to that a uh, little bit more in a moment. Now this is the larger area. Now I calculated the texture on top of the pole figures, and again there is a very weak one 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 fiber, as you can see here. Now. Going back to the to the map, of course, I can do a grain size, I can do misorientations, I can do all the normal EBSD analysis. And then I tried another one. And this was on a sample where I had collected a few of the images I've shown in the beginning. And here, I just have an area at the top, what is it, 20% of the map, where the indexing is clearly much worse than further down. And this is the effect of a single beam pass on the sample. So that's that's the, um, the level of sensitivity. So when you are imaging and you are taking a little bit too long to focus and do the astigmatism corrections, then you have effectively destroyed your crystal structure. So this is a very nice illustration of, of what happens. Here we just measured a little bit longer and everything is gone. So what you need to do on a material like this is go to a, an area that you're going to sacrifice, analyze or, or optimize the beam, focus everything, zoom out to the 
uh, magnification you want to use, move the stage and immediately start mapping. Start always map on a clean, fresh area, and that should allow you to get um, good indexing results. OK, now the last few slides that I have are um, on lithium. Um, this is not so much a beam sensitive materials, but is a few, uh, it's a different type of analysis that I would like to share with you. And first of all, this is um, some work I've done together with Imperial College in London. Uh, Dr. Wang, Professor Giuliani, and Dr. Markart. And this is uh, a clarity EBSD pattern of a lithium ion battery cathode. So this nicely polished, we could get really good diffraction patterns from here. I could use that to optimize my um, structure file. It's a trigonal material. You see a lot of detail. But the problem that we had was during mapping that in most grains, we had more than one orientation possibility. There is a pseudosymmetry in this trigonal structure. So for this analysis, we were comparing the experimental patterns for just one or two patterns per grain against dynamic simulations in, in OAM analysis. And so here's the, the first one. When I indexed this, um, I got four EBSD orientation solutions. Now, on the left is the experimental pattern, and on the right is um, a sequence of dynamic simulations. And when you look at this, you would say, how can you have a problem with that? These patterns look totally different. Now, there was one thing we noticed. The um, simulations were much more different than the actual patterns. So apparently, we didn't really get the atomic positions right. But even so, just, just look at the bands. If you look at this band here, and that one, and that one, those are in exactly the same orientation in all of these diffraction patterns. And those are the ones that were really stronger in um, the experimental patterns um, compared to those. So now these are the top four. Then I just say, OK, let's take a look. And in this case, I'm looking at those three bands. And if I go back here, these bands appear the same. And here, this one seems to have a number of higher order reflections. Here it's at the top, here it's at the right of the triangle, and here it's at the left of the triangle. So this yellow line indicates an asymmetry. So it's not the same. And then just, just to illustrate that you can see that, just ignore the rest of the pattern in this case. You can see that, and then we can index it because we know that those three have to be the same. So then we can get a reliable indexing confirmation. Here's another one. Um, on the left is the experimental pattern, and the patterns on the right already look a little bit more similar than what we had before, but now, here in the experimental pattern, you have this band here and this one. They look about the same, but this one is a bit blurry in the middle. So this, this looks like it's one of the other types of bands. And when we look at the simulations, top and right here are the same. Here, the top and the left are the same. The one on the right is different. Here on the left is different. Here on the top is different. And here they are all three the same. So again, indicated with this overlay. Where are the similar ones? And based on that, you can nicely identify the orientation. And these were the, the more critical ones. It looked like twin lamellae or twin boundaries here. And here on, on this image, if you look at all the main bands, the patterns are identical. But if you look a bit more carefully, you can see here a faint white band, a, a narrow one, and here's another one. That doesn't happen here. Here, that band goes through there, for example, and there's one going horizontal, which is not present here. 
So there is a, a very small difference um, between those orientations that if you go to normal low pattern resolution indexing, the software will never pick up. So when I index those, so here I indicated those are the bands of interest to look for. And when you look at those in the simulations, we are seeing them here as well. And in the simulations, they are actually much cleaner. And that tells you something about the, yeah, the formation and, and the phase behavior of the material. My suspicion here is that some of those bands are related to stacking faults. So if you have some stacking faults, they, they go fuzzy and they disappear. And in the simulation, we don't have that. We are assuming a perfect crystal. So here we can see this. So this one, and here we have those two bands. And that again, indexes very nicely. We can identify for sure what we have and get a proper orientation determination. And then you can use this for FIP lamella extraction or any other oriented analysis that you may want to do. Now, the last few slides, um, something that I would like to briefly present because it's something we're quite proud of. Um, lithium um, is, is becoming more and more important. Of course, in electric cars, um, batteries are using uh, lithium in many cases, and also all kinds of alloys uh, where lithium is of interest. And so the, the analysis of, of lithium compounds is, is becoming more and more of interest. And when we look here, um, we can get SCM images of these battery materials. We can do EBSD mapping of these uh, structural alloys, but you cannot see lithium. So when you look at um, EDS mapping, then lithium is typically invisible. So what can we do there? So just as an example here, this is a small map of a magnesium lithium aluminium alloy, which has 18 weight percent lithium in it. And we can identify the magnesium aluminium. There's a bit of carbon in here as well. Um, so we can see that, but we cannot see the lithium. Now, one additional problem with lithium detection is that you have no guarantee that there are going to be any X-rays, even if you have lithium, and if you could see it, because it depends on the, the bonding type of lithium, if there is actually an electron available to generate an X-ray. That's not always the case. And obviously, the very low energy of lithium X-rays um, makes that they are very easily absorbed before they ever reach the EDS sensor. Now, there are cases where you can see lithium with EDS, but what you have to keep in mind there is you need to have about more than about 20 weight percent lithium to even see it. Otherwise, any lithium signal is going to be absorbed. So if you have about half the atoms in a sample being lithium, then you can see it. Otherwise, it just doesn't give you any signal. And a new tool has been developed. Um, and it's, it's a combined technique where we are looking at a backscattered electron signal that we quantify. So we look at the backscatter coefficient of the entire area. And then we also look at the EDS signal. So we quantify whatever composition we have. And to do that, here we use the, the GATAN on-point detector, which is a very sensitive um, low KV backscatter detector and the Octane Elite Super. That's for the EDS analysis. And what we can do there is we know the elements we see. We can calculate the backscatter coefficient we expect with a calibrated backscatter image on the on-point detector we can see what the difference is from what we expect based on the chemistry, and that difference can be assigned, in this case, to lithium. And then we can quantify the lithium content. Um, this has been uh, confirmed with another uh, tool. So we have, we're pretty sure that we 
um, we get this right. And just to illustrate, there here is a small map on uh, this type of material where we just have the SCM image, magnesium, aluminium, and here on the lower left is the lithium map where we can quantify from zero up to about 60% in a beautiful mapping. So we don't need half of the material to contain of lithium. So that is something I just wanted to quickly um, present to you. And now just to summarize this, when you have a low noise direct detection, you can get indexable, nice quality EBSD patterns with minimal beam currents. In many cases, you only need about 10 electrons per pixel of the diffracted signal. So it depends a little bit on the atomic number and the background, um, how much you actually need, but that's, that's um, more or less the limit. Um, if you go to low density materials, light materials, you need a bit longer. And you may have to find your sweet spot between KV, uh, the backscatter yield, um, the sensitivity to damage of a material to find where you are uh, getting the best results. I find that in general, I get most of my results at 8 kV to 12 kV and beam currents between 50 and 200 picoamp. So in that, that range, I could get EBSD mapping risk data on, for example, all the perovskite samples that I've shown. So that allows you to have a nice successful analysis of beam sensitive materials, including biominerals that are sensitive with organic material and these perovskites. And then some recent developments to improve the orientation and chemical analysis of lithium compounds as well. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention.